So today we're going through depth in chemistry from June 2016. So the first question, uh, relatively straightforward, it asks me for the electronic configuration of magnesium. Uh, if you look up in your periodic table, magnesium's got an atomic number of 12, uh, therefore I need to put 12 electrons into my orbitals, and you build them up from the uh, lowest um, in energy, which is 1s2, 2s2, then 2p6, 3s2. Now wants me to explain what happens when magnesium is oxidized in terms of electron transfer. So magnesium, when it reacts with oxygen, is going to form MgO. So if it's MgO, the charge on magnesium, as being in group 2, is going to be Mg2+, plus, um, because the oxygen is obviously O2-. Minus. And therefore magnesium is going to lose 2 electron. So when um, magnesium is oxidizes, it loses two electrons. Okay, so now moving on, we're going to write an equation for the second ionization of neostrontium. So if it's the second ionization of neostrontium, I am forming SR2+. Plus. So I start off with SR+, plus. remember this is in the gaseous state, to form SR2 plus in the gaseous state plus an electron. So why is the first ionization energy of strontium less than that of calcium? Well, strontium is obviously further down the group than calcium, and therefore strontium has a larger atomic radius. Uh, it will also have increased shielding because there are more shells um, between the outer electron and the nucleus. The outermost electron is going to be further away from the nucleus, and therefore there is going to be less nuclear attraction between the nucleus and the outer electron, and therefore it is easier to be lost. So less nuclear attraction. So this is a rather basic diagram of how you would uh, go about doing this reaction. This is, of course, your conical flask. Uh, it does ask for a labelled diagram, so make sure it's labelled. And this is going to be your syringe. Um, and you'd probably want it to be a 100 centimetre cube syringe because you are collecting 97 centimetres cubed of gas. Okay, so I'm now going to work out the identity of group 2 metal. You'll notice that they have told me that I have formed 97 centimetres cubed of gas at room temperature and pressure. So that means that my moles of gas, or moles of hydrogen, is going to equal 97 divided by 24,000, which is equal to 4.04 times 10 to the minus 3. So, if I now look at my molar ratio, for every 1 mole of hydrogen, I've got 1 mole of metal. So that is also the same as the number of moles of metal M. So I can then work out my molar mass, which is mass, uh, they told me, as being 0.162 over here, divided by the moles, which is 4.04, times 10 to the minus 3 and if you do that calculation you will find it is 40.1 grams per mole. So which group 2 metal must that be? Well the one it's going to be is going to be calcium. So if I repeated the experiment but used a metal from lower down the group would the volume of hydrogen be greater or less or the same? Well, if you have a think about it, the number of moles is equal to the mass divided by the molar mass. So mass for all of these is going to be the same, but my molar mass is going to get larger as I go down the group. If this gets larger, the number of moles is going to get smaller. And obviously, if the this gets smaller, then the number of moles of hydrogen will get smaller, and therefore the volume of gas will also get smaller. 
So for this one, you've got to be quite careful because they want you to compare the melting point of phosphorus and chlorine. Both phosphorus and chlorine have a simple molecular structure, all of these guys do, um, and therefore they have London forces between the molecule. It can't be any other type of intermolecular force because the atoms are the same. So you can't have permanent dipole-dipole and obviously you can't have hydrogen bonding. So you've got London forces between all of them and the strength of your London forces depends on uh, the number of electrons. Now if you have a look, phosphorus is this as P4, chlorine as Cl2. So phosphorus is going to have more electrons, therefore it will have stronger London forces and therefore there will be more energy required to break those London forces between the P4 molecules. Right, for this next one then, um, magnesium and silicon, they have different types of giant structure. Magnesium is going to be giant metallic and silicon is going to be giant covalent. So, for magnesium, you've obviously got metallic bonds between the, uh, um, throughout the structure and the bonds are between the Mg2 plus ions and the delocalized electrons. For silicon, as I said, that's a giant covalent structure, so you've got covalent bonds between the silicon atoms. Right, for this next one then, you need to um, perhaps persevere a little bit with the balancing. So you know you've got Al2S3, you are adding it to water, um, and you are making aluminium hydroxide and hydrogen sulfide. So you need to make sure you work out the formula of aluminium hydroxide correctly. The hydroxide ion is OH minus. Aluminium in group three is Al3 plus. So you're gonna need three of those for the formula. So it's Al brackets OH close brackets three. Now you need to balance that up. Well, you've got three sulfur uh, atoms there. And therefore, you're going to need to have a 3 in front of the H2S. You've got two aluminiums there, so you're going to need to have a 2 in front of the aluminium hydroxide. And if you count up your hydrogens and oxygens, that means you need six H2Os. So, on to question 3. One difference between a sigma bond and a pi bond well, a sigma bond uh, is between the bonding atoms, whereas a pi bond is obviously above and below the nuclei. Um, if you remember, when you draw the, that's your sigma bond there, your pi bond is formed from your p orbitals here and the overlap above and uh, below the nuclei. Why does carbon A not have EZ isom isomers? Well, to have EZ isomers, you need to have different groups on these carbons. But as you can see, I've got CH3 groups on that carbon there. And therefore, it doesn't matter if I swap them around because it's still a CH3 group. So that's why. Um, it tells me now that a structural isomer of compound A does have EZ isomers. The way you can do that is if you put all the carbons in a chain, um, so it's going to be uh, a pent, um, pentene molecule. Um, obviously the double bond can't be on the first carbon because obviously the hydrogens would then be um, on the end of the double bond and they're both the same. So it needs to be pent-2ene. So if you draw pent-2ene, you're going to have your carbon carbon double bond there you'll have a methyl group there a hydrogen there um, and then you can have a hydrogen there and then ch2 ch3 there and that would be wrong why is that wrong well uh, that would actually be the e isomer um, because uh, the groups are on the um, the two hydrogens are on opposite sides so let's change that around um, I want the hydrogen there and then I want CH2 
CH3 there, and then that is the Z isomer that they've asked me for, and it is Z pent 2 E. Okay, because uh, I've drawn compound A again here, so you can see it clearly, and it tells me that this can be made from alcohol B, um, and this is obviously a dehydration reaction. So from a dehydration reaction, you're removing water. So the two structures, you could have the H and the OH there, which you're removing, or you could swap them around, and you could have the OH there and the H there. So the two structures are going to be, uh, we're going to have H3C, C, O, H, H, and then that's going to be H there, C, H3, C, H3, and the other one is where I swapped that H and the O, H around, so this bit remains the same, all of this bit, because this comes from the original uh, molecule, but now instead I'm going to have the H there and the OH there. And if you go back, if you remove that and that, you will get the same molecule compound A. Okay, this is really quite a lovely jubbly question if it comes up. Um, Okay, so I'm reacting compound A now with hydrogen bromide. Um, it wants me to give you a mechanism which is going to be electrophilic addition, and it also wants me to tell the minor and the major product. So before we, we kick off with this one, remember if you are adding a uh, molecule, an unsymmetrical molecule like hydrogen bromide across a double bond, the hydrogen atom joins the carbon which already has the most hydrogens attached, which is going to be that one there. So that would give me the major product. So first of all, let's draw the two um, structures um, for the products formed. So let's give that one a go. So the, the two structures, uh, H3C, um, you're basi I'm basically going to draw this twice so this is just same but I am going to get rid of that double bond there and then I'm going to have the other one HCCCH3 and then CH3 there and CH3 there but on this one I will put the H there and the BR there but on this one I'll put the BR there and the H there and this one will be my major product. Right, so they now want the mechanism. So let's give that a go. So uh, let's start off again with compound A. Here we go. Um, now the HBr is going to approach it like so. The hydrogen is going to be delta positive and the bromine delta negative. Uh, and then I'm going to form the major product, so uh, the bond is formed there, and this bond breaks to uh, go, to both electrons go to the bromine, so I end up with this guy, this carbocation, like so, where my H is added there, my double bond's broken, I've got a positive charge, on that carbon there, Br minus like so with a lone pair, and then that is going to form a bond to the carbon atom there to give me my product.